we need to catch up with events in the World Under-20 Championship taking place in Mexico City right now. I'm going to show you a game uh, which is a fascinating, strategically rich King's Indian defence. Uh, more on that in a second, but let me just give you the score. So they've played eight rounds and there are three players sharing the lead with six and a half. Gleb Dudin from Hungary, Santiago Avila from Colombia, and Marc-Andrea Morizzi from France. They have six and a half. And then there are seven players just behind on six points. So I think it's going to be a photo finish. They play 11 rounds, three to go. But let me show you this game. Played between Konstantin Peira, who's from Austria, and Hans Niemann playing black. So both players had five points going into this eighth round game. It's, it's very interesting. So starts out as a King's Indian defense. Well, we know that Hans is, is up for a fight, very uncompromising player, and that can sometimes lead to disasters for him and sometimes leads, leads to great success. He's a bit of an all or nothing character. H3. Now, this variation, I have to say, I like very much playing with white. What white is trying to do is take the fight to black. I know that often I criticise these little pawn moves at the side of the board. But the idea is that later on, white is going to play g4 and really cramp black on the king side. And sometimes you can actually launch a king side attack yourself. So I think it's a great way of you know, trying to take the initiative with white on the king side. And that often disturbs a lot of King's Indian players, actually, because, you know, they're the ones that like to do the attacking. So, for example, if black plays for this kind of normal position, then, uh, and this knight moves, then you can play g4 and really restrict black from playing the, the normal push f5. But... Niemann goes in a very different way. He plays knight c6, a, a really provocative move. And well, one of the ideas is that you want to play e5, and after d5, you throw the knight into d4 very quickly. So this provokes white into pushing with d5. Well, it looks like you're gaining time. But again, knight e5, very provocative. You could bounce the knight round here. But knight e5 is the most provocative move. You know, you're you're inviting your opponent to play f4, but of course, um, setting up this huge pawn barrier in the middle, it weakens a lot of squares behind those pawns. So white's careful for the moment. Bishop e2, e6, looking to open up the e-file. Well, white's king is still there on the e-file, so why not? And again, black is hoping that white will push here. And then you can see how these squares are just a lot weaker. You know, black's king is already safe and ready to play rook e8. But knight f3, I mean, that's a, a far more prudent choice than f4. You could go back with knight d7 here, but it's certainly not as dangerous for white as the other line. Niemann just decides to exchange. And then he throws the knight round here. Might come to e5, might come to c5. And of course it opens up the bishop's diagonal. Rook c1 covers the knight. And a5. So this is such a typical move in the king's Indian. You're preventing white from playing b4. And in that way you're trying to secure this lovely c5 square for the knight. White castles. And Niemann plays knight c5. It's possible for black just to play e5 here. And we reach this very typical King's Indian pawn formation. And then you push with f5. Absolutely typical counterplay on the king side. That's what I always try to avoid <laughs> if I'm playing with white against the King's Indian. But knight c5 played instead by Neiman, and here, whatever you do with white, don't give up that dark square bishop. 
that's dreadful. Then this bishop on g7 has no opponent. You just don't want to do that. Even if you think it's a good move, don't do it. Rook e1 played. Okay, solid rook into the middle. And, and now Niemann decides to play e5. So we've got this typical situation with a closed pawn formation in the middle. And black is pushing with f5. And on the other side of the board, white wants to get in b4, push the knight away, and then potentially go for c5, opening up the c-file and get to counterplay like that. f5. And b4. Well, does the knight want to fall back? Not really. If you go back to a6, then queen b3 doesn't feel right to put the knight there. It's a bit passive. The queen occupies a nice square. You know, it feels like any play on the king side for black is going to be too slow. And for white, it's, it's all coming very quickly. So after this... Niemann exchanges on e4, so if pawn takes knight, then pawn takes bishop. So bishop takes, you, you could play knight takes here, it, it leads to something very similar actually, but bishop takes, and knight takes bishop, knight takes knight. Again, we have a very typical uh, King's Indian situation where after the exchange on e4, white has this nice blockading knight, so the pawn is blockaded, and that ensures that the bishop on g7 isn't a very good piece. White has got in b4, which is the first step to pushing with c5 and getting counterplay here and possibly weakening that pawn. On the other hand, because black played a5, then this rook occupies the open file and there's potentially counterplay down there. So it's still very, very balanced. Bishop f5 is a good move. That knight really needs challenging. So that's a threat. And white plays bishop g5, hitting the queen, and that means the knight is now protected. And this is a, a crunch moment in the game, where white now plays something very committal. It's kind of understandable. Um, well, more, more on the game continuation in a second. I suppose a normal move here would be something like queen d2, support the bishop on this diagonal. And then, well, black might well exchange off bishop for knight and bring the queen to f5, hitting the rook. Then let's say f3. Okay, rook a4. This is black's counterplay. And if c5 then doubling rooks on the a file. Now, with these rooks here, you feel that black is always going to have sufficient counterplay here. Yes, that bishop isn't very good on f6. Yes, white has the potential to, to uh, enter on the c file. But actually, I think black's pieces, the, the major pieces, stand very well. Even that bishop could come to f6, and if the, the exchange is declined, it might bounce around here at some point, or even into a, uh, h4, you never know. So I, I think it's it's a dynamic balance, basically, but it feels to me like black is always going to have sufficient counterplay with those fantastic rooks. But white was obviously a bit spooked and, and wanted to try to force the issue, try to get more control in the position and play g4. Obviously, highly committal, advancing a pawn in front of the king. However, it does force the exchange. And you can see the difference between this position and the previous one, that white now has control over the f5 square, so that queen can't occupy this square, or rook either. So white, at the moment, seems to have more control on the king side. Is that weak? Well, don't, the g-pawn isn't really weak. There is a problem with g4, as we're going to see a little bit later. But I sort of understand why white wanted to get more control in the position. But as we're going to see, there are problems with it. Bishop f6. Okay, so this is a very poor piece. 
and it makes sense to to offer this exchange that certainly would benefit black and then well after the doubling on the f file certainly white's position uh, doesn't look as good as it did a couple of moves ago so after bishop f6 white declines the exchange i mean Niemann could just drop back with the bishop uh, but I suspect this bishop would come all the way back here. But anyway, instead he plays rook f7. And that's quite crafty because sometimes it's possible for black to play bishop h4, attacking this one, and then even play g5, shutting in the bishop. So white has to be careful here. Rook a1. Niemann decides to keep the rooks on the board. He doesn't exchange. This is, in this is interesting. I mean, the exchange would give the queen some uh, some prospects here. So I think rook e8 is a good move because it means the, the 8th rank is still protected. Although at the moment the rook isn't uh, very active on e8. So this is still an issue, bishop h4. So the bishop drops back. Bishop h4 could be met by g5 in this position. So not good here, but rook f8. So, Niemann was absolutely correct in keeping both rooks on the board. And there's potential pressure here. Rook a2, so that guards f2. I mean, at the moment, it feels like, you know, white has things under control here. You know, the king side looks pretty solid. Certainly g4 isn't really, the g4 pawn itself isn't an issue. But watch what Niemann does. Queen d8, excellent move. So that takes more control over these squares. Queen c1. So uh, white wants to prevent the bishop coming to g5. And if bishop h4, then actually g5 with the rook hitting the bishop is something of a problem. Bishop g7. Bishop goes back. Not the most active. You know, we would like to come out here, but it's not happening. However, this introduces a new theme in the position, as we're about to see. Bishop g5. Okay, stops stops the queen coming here. That was that was one of the themes. Queen d7, and the king comes up to g2. So that feels right to try and protect these squares. However, now we can see the other point to dropping this bishop back, even though it doesn't look very active. Rook f3. So now we're seeing the massive drawback of g4, that the f3 square has been weakened and this rook sits beautifully here. If we go way back to when, to this position, When white played rook a1, Niemann was absolutely right to decline that rook exchange because it's if the rooks were exchanged, then black would never get the counterplay on f3. So let's come back here. So the rook has just moved to f3. So you can see those double rooks, absolutely crucial for black in getting counterplay on the king side. Queen d1. Well, is it possible to take? Queen takes rook. I would say that position certainly is uh, desirable. So queen f7 protects this one and threatens rook takes pawn. So this is interesting. Uh, White decides to bring the bishop back to e3, which feels like the most secure way of playing. But it's actually a mistake. I mean, queen e2 doesn't look as secure. I can imagine that, that he was worried about b5. That undermines the protection for this pawn. In fact, white is okay in this position. Um, that exchange, although it looks quite nice with these center pawns, but actually white is okay here. But bishop e3... Feels more secure, but it's a big mistake. Queen f6, with that queen looking to get into h4 sometimes. 
Uh, but also it sets this one up, bishop h6. So black wants to remove the bishop and simply crash in here. So bishop h6 is, is simply losing like this, and then rook f3, game over. So there's a threat to take here and take on f2 with these beautiful tripled uh, major pieces on the f-file. Queen e2 protects f2, but now queen h4. So we can see that, yep, the problems with g4 are coming home to roost. The, it did actually weaken those squares, although it's taken some very clever play by Niemann to exploit the, uh, the drawbacks um, of g4. So queen takes pawn threatened, white has to take first glance it feels as though well white might have might be over the worst here um, but in fact it's amazing how black's queen is able to exploit the weaknesses in white's position there are actually quite a few weak points here queen g2 i mean I, i've said it before the queen is like a heat-seeking missile you know it just spots weaknesses and it's able to target them so well. So first of all, that's a great move. Hitting the rook here. Um, white plays rook c4 here, allowing the queen to take and actually white's position starts to collapse. But let's just, instead of rook c4, let's just have a look at king d3. Because I think this shows how strong that queen can be, even though it feels for the moment as though White is sort of holding things together, but watch what happens. There are so many weak points here. This is the point. And actually, this position is a kind of Zugzwang. You know, white can barely move. Um, for example, I don't know, queen, king here. You can give a check. And everything just kind of falls apart it's fascinating or b5 okay we can take that king is of course very exposed and uh, that's the problem when you advance lots of pawns the king suddenly has very little protection and you can see how oh okay i've i've put red red rings around all the weaknesses in white's position i would count the king as a weakness as well because it's so exposed something is going to drop here and well the immediate problem is that rook is hanging and that pawn anyway in the game instead of king d3 rook c4 played and of course queen takes d5 i mean white still has all the same problems just trying to keep everything together this is an important next move okay the queen has done lots of damage and White has managed to protect everything at the moment. Um, it's queen and two pawns against two rooks. So should be winning for black. But you've got to finish it off. And this next move is really important. Okay, have a think. How would you play here with black? Black to play. What's the, the tidiest move here? That's the tidiest move. King f7. You make sure the king comes off the back rank so it never gets trapped there with a rook here and it's going to sit beautifully on e6. It protects those pawns, the pawns protect the king, everything is secure and then the queen just runs riot basically. So white is trying to stir things up but to no avail. King f6, good move because it means in this position once the f-pawn disappears then the king is going to find another secure home, this time on g5. And a check, and the queen switches over, and here white resigned. Well, okay, white obviously demoralized, didn't want to try to, to hang on any longer. I mean, it is hopeless. He he could have tried for a bit longer, but let, let, let me show you what might happen. Um, a check. King can hide here. Let's say rook d2. Well, you know, this one is dropping, but you know, you could play b5 first. 
Uh, and there's nothing the king can do, actually. The king can't move. So black is just making all these improving moves first, and then you can take here and come back. And yeah, the king is secure. The rooks aren't protected either. That's another problem. So the king and the two rooks have to keep together, bunch together, but it's all very passive. Well, I thought that was a really impressive game by Hans Niemann, actually, um, from a position which was roughly balanced. Yes, White made this very committal move, but I think Niemann exploited those weaknesses beautifully and understood that he had to keep all the major pieces on the board, even giving up that, that A file for a, well to, to switch the rook across. To the, uh, to the other side of the board. But yeah, g4, that's the mistake. Got to play a solid move like queen d2 or f3 just to, to, to hunker down basically on the king side. So that victory meant that uh, Niemann joins all those players on six points. So with three rounds to go, it is incredibly close. You can follow the games live. Uh, there's between London and Mexico City, there's a seven hour time difference. But if you're in North America or South America, then you can follow the games very easily, easily at a civilized hour. So, yeah, do check it out. And I'll I'll try to check in if I've got a bit of time and uh, let you know what's happening in in those final rounds. Thanks very much for watching.